Hi, my name is Robert. Please read the comments in the About section of this video. It has valuable information and updates. My YouTube channel has a disclaimer video that I encourage you to watch. And please, like, share, and subscribe. I hope you find what you're looking for. Thank you very much for watching. In my recent travels, I've talked to a few of my viewers about uh, how I obtain my car and a few other things. And some of them seem to enjoy those stories a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you how I came in possession to this black 95 wagon that I call Panther. About a year after I decided that I could no longer work a normal job, I decided that I needed a vehicle to do odd jobs in. And I currently had a yellow 95 T5R and I also had a uh, 19, I think it was a 97 960 that was in, in incredibly good condition and it had about 115,000 miles. At any rate, I began to troll Craigslist for listings for a Volvo wagon. I was specifically looking for a yellow Volvo wagon just in hopes to stumble across one. There was, I believe, 33 or less of them on the road in the U.S., so I really didn't have my hopes up too high. At the time, I was normally waking up. I guess it was around uh, 3.30, 4.30 each morning. So around 4.30 in the morning, I began to troll different Craigslist listings in different parts of the U.S. In the Boston area Craigslist, this vehicle popped up for sale. Uh, advertised with a bad transmission and the gentleman was asking uh, $4,500 for it. He must have done a little bit of research, was told that it was somewhat rare, so he was going to try to get a few dollars out of it. The listing was only about three or four hours old, so I thought, wow, it hadn't been on here that long, maybe I'll have a slim chance to get it, being a rare black wagon. Uh, so I thought I'll send him a text message. So I sent the guy a text message asking him for the VIN number because at the time it wasn't in the listing. Lo and behold, within five minutes, I received a text message back from the owner with the VIN number. I thought, wow, this is incredible. I might have a slight chance of getting this vehicle. Most of the vehicles, these 95 wagons that I've seen, come up for sale on Craigslist, usually sold within, I mean, three or four hours on the internet. So I didn't have high hopes, but I said, what the heck, at least I'll run the VIN and see what's going on. I woke up a few hours later and ran the VIN and the VIN had no accidents. The ad said something about the transmission was not acting proper. So he believed or told people to lead them to believe that it was a computer problem with the vehicle and that the transmission was actually okay, but the transmission that functions the but the computer that functions the transmission was defective. At any rate, I didn't think about it no more for the rest of the day and I checked for the listing the next morning. Lo and behold, the next morning the listing was still there this 95 wagon for sale. So I sent a message to the owner requesting some more pictures because the pictures of the vehicle were horrible. It looked like it might have been raining or snowing when the vehicle uh, pictures was taken. And uh, the time of the year was in, I think, early April of 2011. At any rate, I waited a few hours, didn't get any pictures. The Later that day, I tried to contact them, no contact. The next day, no contact. But the next day, I noticed the ad appeared again, but the ad had different information in it and two or three different prices. It had the $4,500 price, it had a $2,500 price, and the $3,200 price. I was like, man, what's going on here? On the third day, another ad appeared for the vehicle. Now the vehicle actually had two prices in Craigslist, and one of them made no sense at all, but the other ad was still there with yet 
two different prices. So the vehicle is now being advertised with three prices again, the lowest price being around $2,200 and two other prices. So I contacted the seller again, talked to the guy. I told him that I wanted the car. I was likely going to purchase it, but I needed to sell my 960. I was finishing the detailing up on my 960 that day, and he really needed to let me know if he sold the vehicle because I didn't want to sell my 960 unless he was still able to sell me this 95 wagon. While on the phone with him, he made a statement about why I didn't get the pictures, which was a little confusing to me. But nonetheless, I knew he still had the vehicle. And I came to the conclusion that this person that had the vehicle was strung out on some kind of uh, uh, synthetic drugs. I think that guy was on meth. So there I was on a mission to purchase a car, uh, possibly from somebody 15, 1600 miles away that was unfortunately strung out on some synthetic drugs, but he had this vehicle that I wanted. My theory was that the guy was actually chasing away buyers. That's why he still had the vehicle. I put my 960 on Craigslist for sale and got an offer every day for four or five days. I sold my 960 to a lady. A couple people got upset and mad at me because I didn't hold it for them. And I sold the car actually for more than Kelly Blue Book, which is a Blue Book rating I don't really trust or understand. And I got a good price for it. So off I was to negotiate a good deal on this wagon. Knowing that the guy was chasing away his buyers and he still had the vehicle for sale and he was probably uh, desperate for some uh, synthetic drugs, I decided I was going to make it the best deal I could. So I monitored the guy for a day or two, and when I thought he was uh, what they call jonesing, I started making him offers to purchase the vehicle. I got the guy's uh, fax number from where he or his wife was able to get fax. I sent them an offer for the vehicle for basically uh, $1,500, and I told him if he delivered the vehicle to the airport to meet me, I would give him additional $100. Well, he wasn't thrilled about that, so I let that sit four or five hours, and then I called him back that evening and just started talking to him about accepting that offer. Uh, sad to say, I had a business partner that was on meth, and if you hit those people in the right time, they seem to be pretty desperate. I called the guy back that evening. I must have said the word cash about 28 times in three minutes. I told him that he needed to text me a picture of his signature on the contract because there's one thing I know about meth addicts is they are pretty functional. They like to think that they're very functional. And one thing for sure, they don't like jail time. So I sent him an offer for uh, $1,400. I told him I'd give him another $200 to get the vehicle to the airport to, for me, which was still the same $1,600. I told him once I got a signature back from him, I would send him $400 through a, a MoneyGram uh, system. Then once I got the title, which he was supposed to overnight to me, I'd send him another $400. And then once I got my airline ticket, I'd send him another uh, couple hundred bucks. And then I'd give him the rest of the money when I showed up. He wasn't real thrilled about it, but I did convince him to send me the, the text message because once I got the signature back from him, I knew that I had a legal binding contract. And during that last few seconds of the phone call, I heard him and his wife or girlfriend, whoever she was, getting into it. And it was apparent to me that she was also strung out on stuff. So I hit the hang up button, set the phone down. I turned to my wife and I told her, both of these folks are messed up on that stuff. Then I looked down at my phone, and the phone hadn't hung up. So there was a great chance that both of them heard it. But there's one thing about somebody strung out on synthetic drugs. It don't matter what you say to them. Them getting their drugs is more important than you're offending them. So, nonetheless, four or five minutes later, I got the text message. I went down to Walmart and sent them the $400 deposit that he needed. 
during the time that I investigated uh, some issues with the vehicle, and one of the things I asked him for was a picture of a title before I sent him a contract, was that the car was never registered in this gentleman's name. The car was actually parked at his brother's impound lot. His brother had a towing company, and the previous owner of the vehicle was a fire chief who I did speak with that told me that the car had a bad transmission and that he didn't think it would make it back to Little Rock, Arkansas from the Boston area. Nonetheless, I wasn't real concerned with that. I'm pretty adventurous, so I uh, got him to accept the offer. I knew he didn't want to spend any jail time, and I was waiting for my title to be overnighted. Needless to say, 48 hours later, I still had no title. The cycle of life with people that are addicted to chemicals is that uh, once they get money and get their drug of choice, you're probably not going to hear from them for three or four days because, you know, they get high, they're strung out, then they start tweaking, and then they get to where they're almost normal. So on the third day, I contacted them. I must have said the words that I was going to call the sheriff and have them arrested four or five times that I, if I hadn't gotten my title within the next day. And that day, he was able to mail me the title, which was still in the previous uh, person's name. And it was signed, but it didn't have a buyer signature. So I got that title two days later because by the time I caught him on the third day, he didn't have enough money to overnight it, just enough to send it priority mail through the Postal Service. So via our promise, I sent him another 400 bucks or 600 bucks, but I did not send him the new plates for the vehicle because I planned for him to get those plates about two days before I got there. After talking with his brother, I learned that the vehicle had not been started for several months and his brother and him was having uh, issues about that car being on his lot. So his brother desperately wanted to move it, uh, wanted to get it off his lot. So I talked to his brother and his brother assured me that he would help his brother get that car off of that lot and have help him get it delivered to the airport, or whatever it took. I purchased airline tickets for my wife and I. Together, I think they might have been around, I don't know, $180 for two one way from Little Rock to the Boston area, or they might have been as, as high as $240. At any rate, it was about $120 a piece. So two days before we flew to the Boston area to pick up the vehicle, I, I overnighted him the plates on the car so that he can get it on the road. I didn't want him to have it too many days. I didn't want him to get him uh, stuck in his head that he could possibly sell a car for some drugs or, or get desperate for some uh, money and end up selling a vehicle for some drugs. But hey, I was willing to take the chance and I sent him the plates and we were flying up there on a Wednesday. I made arrangements for him to meet us in Providence, uh, Rhode Island. He said it was uh, midway between where he was and uh, it didn't make a difference to him whether he went to Boston or Rhode Island. So Rhode Island was cheaper to fly into. We got there around three in the afternoon. Man, I tell you, uh, the airport was somewhat empty, but he was there waiting for us and waiting on his other 600 bucks. So I met him. He took me out to the car to check it out before I could give him the rest of his money. So we get out to the vehicle, and while we're walking out there, he's explaining to me that, hey, the transmission is in a little bit worse shape than he remembered. He uh, had a little bit of issues getting it there. He said it, it runs, it starts right up, uh, it does move along. First drive, it slips a lot, takes a while to get into first gear. Second gear, it slips. It slips going into third, but he said once it gets into third, it runs like the wind. I looked at the guy and said, look, man, I got to drive 1,500 miles. I'm going to need first and second a lot. At any rate, we got together. He started the car for me, which cranked extremely slow. It had a bad battery in it, but I guess that's what his brother felt like giving him. And he started the car up and was uh, going on to show me how the transmission engages. He puts the key in the ignition. It fires up. I'm like, man, this car doesn't really like to start. 
He said, no, no, it's okay. It's been fine the last couple of days. I've been driving it like this, and uh, you won't have any problems. It's going to start. It's going to get you where you're going. So he shifts the car and drive, and the door's open, and I'm watching it, and he doesn't have his foot on the brake. So the car's sitting in this parking spot. Ten seconds go by. Twenty seconds go by. Thirty seconds go by. Forty seconds go by. A minute goes by. About a minute and a half of sitting and drive, the car finally makes a little noise, and it makes a little bump forward. And it starts to coast forward like it finally went in gear after a minute and a half of sitting. I immediately looked around, and I looked at the little shack, the security shack, where people bring cars into the parking lot. And I'm looking at these people like, you really didn't let no one tow a vehicle into a airport parking lot post 9-11. I know that didn't happen. So, at any rate, I went on ahead, gave the guy the rest of his money. I figured, hey, it drove there. It'll get me somewhere away from here. And I took the keys off of him and began my journey home. Lo and behold, the airport loses my carry-on bag. For some reason, they checked it, lost my carry-on bag. So they ended up paying for me and my wife to stay a night there in Providence, buying our meals, giving us vouchers for this and that. They probably paid out somewhere around 200 to 250 bucks just compensating for losing our carry-on. I don't know how somebody loses your carry-on. It happened, and we didn't get our bag until about 11 at night. So there was no way for me to uh, take off that late because I was planning on driving couple hundred miles to uh, my cousin's house in New York so we just waited it out and left the next morning. The exterior and interior of the vehicle was extremely dirty. Be honest with you I never seen an interior of a vehicle so dirty in my life. It had so much dirt and dust caked up on the inside from sitting eight nine months that you know I just thought hey as long as dirt comes off It'll be clean and we'll be okay. And I had a uh, transmission computer with me that I took out of my yellow 95, popped it in, made no difference. So we uh, put the car in drive. It took us about five minutes to get out of the parking lot. And we had about a mile and a half drive. Well, I take that back. About three quarters of a mile drive to the uh, hotel in which we never, I don't think, ever made it past third gear and the top speed was about 30 miles an hour. At any rate, it took us about 10 minutes to drive that mile over to the hotel. The next morning I got up and I decided to go check the transmission fluid in the car. I pulled the transmission fluid dipstick out and it looked like it had dirty brown pond water on it smelled uh, not too bad but like I said it was seemed to be watery and brown so I decided that I was going to set out to change the transmission fluid before I hit the road now a lot of people don't know this but these vehicles are equipped with this function button here it's a transmission performance button it has winter economy and sports setting when you use that winter setting the transmission computer orders the transmission to skip first and second gear and go straight into third gear. We loaded up the car, I pushed the winter button, and we took right off like wasn't nothing even wrong. At the time I had a Garmin GPS, so I dialed in the nearest Sears so I can get the tool to remove the transmission drain plug. Then I dialed in uh, Walmart, went and got the fluid, Walmart was first stop, Sears was the second stop, also got a drip pan at Walmart, and I changed the transmission fluid, uh, a drain and fill, right there in the Sears parking lot. After the fluid change, off we went on our journey back home. I figured if something happened and the vehicle didn't make it back home, I'd contact my brother in Pennsylvania to come get me, flatbed this vehicle back to Pennsylvania where I'd fix it. Other than that, my plans was to go visit my relatives in New York, New Jersey, uh, down in the D.C. area, from the D.C. area to the uh, Raleigh, North Carolina area, then to my sisters in Charlotte, 
visit my family there, then head home. First stop between Providence and my cousin's house in New York was FCP Groton at the time. So we stopped there to get a few parts and I changed the transmission fluid in their parking lot and the car again shifted a lot better. I had all my gears back at that time. I went on to New York. The next afternoon, I went and stayed in the D.C. area. A day or two there, I changed the fluid there. After that, the transmission was still shifting pretty good. But while I was uh, riding around in the Raleigh, North Carolina area, I got frustrated with not knowing exactly where I was, punched it, downshifted, and blew first gear out. After that, I was left with nothing but second in the other gears. Anytime I shifted the car in reverse, it seemed like first gear in reverse engaged at the same time. So the car would start to go back and then another gear would kick in to push it forward. So it was kind of like pushing and fighting against each other in reverse. So I would bump it in reverse and then quickly knock it in neutral, get the car drifting backwards, and then I would drive off fine. Once I got to Charlotte, we decided to go visit um, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. So we went down to Myrtle Beach and then back to Charlotte. And all in all, I think we drove about 2,200 miles to get the vehicle from Providence back to Little Rock, Arkansas. So there I was at Little Rock, Arkansas with a little bit over, I guess it was 190 thousand miles and had a bad transmission the engine sounded great the car ran smooth and just about everything in the vehicle worked it had no warning lights or nothing so there you have it that's how i came in possession of my 95 t5r black wagon that i now call panther i did several things to it since then nothing really major other than that transmission change and the car has been uh, running great for the last hundred and 15,000 miles. If you feel that this information was useful, please like it and share it with your social media friends. You can subscribe to my channel so that you will get notifications of future videos that I post. You can follow me on Twitter, and if you need to contact me directly, please visit my website. And if you have any questions, leave them below, and someone or myself will reply to them. Again, thank you very much for watching.